In this segment, among other things, we're going to have a little history lesson. Now, we all know that high crimes and misdemeanors is the bar that a president must cross for possible impeachment. I'm going to start by reading from the actual Constitution itself. Quote, the president and vice president and all civil officers of the United States shall be removed from office on impeachment for and conviction of treason, bribery, or other high crimes and misdemeanors. Treason and bribery are specific, but the framers did not specify what exactly constitutes a high crime or a misdemeanor. But we do know that some of the founders were specifically worried about foreign interference in our democracy. In the Federalist Papers, which were essays written by Alexander Hamilton, James Madison, and John Jay, those founders made their arguments for the states to ratify the Constitution, and several of those pieces specifically pointed out foreign powers meddling and gaining improper access and sway. For more, let's turn now to Stephen Mulroy. Stephen's a constitutional law professor at the University of Memphis. He's also a federal, former federal prosecutor in his own right. Stephen, as always, thanks for the time. Oh, great. Great to be here. You know, in looking um, at uh, the impeachment, uh, possible avenues if Congress chooses to exercise, um, I know that treason um, doesn't necessarily apply, but you could make an argument that bribery does before we even get to high crimes and misdemeanors. And I read directly, it says, for the bribery statute, it's a crime for a public official like Trump to corruptly request a thing of value in return for being influenced in the performance of an official act. That seems to be exactly, um, if the transcripts to be believed, what happened there, and who knows what we'll find out in subsequent conversations with maybe the Saudis or the Russians, et cetera. Right. So if you interpret the transcript, um, or if further evidence reinforces the notion that what Trump was doing was saying, hey, I am holding up this foreign aid that we were otherwise scheduled to give to you, and I'm not going to release it until you do me this favor, which is to provide me opposition research, essentially, which the campaign finance uh, laws have defined as a thing of value, then, yeah, you could say he's soliciting a bribe. In other words, he's soliciting something of value to him in exchange for the performance of an official act releasing the aid. To that end, um, in terms of when we talk high crimes and misdemeanors, abuse of power, we've commonly heard, the founding fathers always amazed me, the foresight these guys had. but. They particularly were concerned, were they not, Stephen, about a foreign country um, meddling or being involved um, in our government and, and all the public being none the wiser. Right. Um, a lot of comments at the time among the founders, including those Federalist Papers that you mentioned earlier, showed a concern about that. And that was why they put into the text of the Constitution the Emoluments Clause, which we've heard a lot about, which specifically says that a president cannot accept any gift or thing of value from a foreign uh, government without Congress approving that. And of course, there are many lawsuits right now saying that some of the business dealings that the Trump Organization has with foreign government entities, in fact, violate the Emoluments Clause. In terms of the inner circle of Trump, and there's been a lot of folks, potentially, that may have had knowledge of some of these conversations, um, and obviously the transcripts as we now now move from one server to basically a lockbox, people knew their, if you believe at least from some of the initial reports and certainly the whistleblower's com complaint, people knew that there was a problem here. Um, and it wasn't just, it seems, just a couple people from uh, how informed uh, the complaint was of the whistleblower when he wasn't present for these conversations. It seems as if we can probably count on a couple of hands the people that were passing along information potentially to him. Who are some of the folks in the inner circle of the president that have reason, to, reason for worry today? <laughs> well, yeah, that's the uh, operative question, isn't it? Because we don't really know um, who all provided the information to the whistleblower. But presumably there were people in the National Security Council staff who heard these conversations, uh, certainly lawyers in the White House, uh, who were the ones who were uh, responsible for diverting that transcript into the lockbox uh, computer uh, area, which was only supposed to be used for, you know, code word, clearance, national security, classified information purposes. I think all those people have uh, cause for concern. I'd also like to add, if I could, Richard, that that other phrase, other high crimes and misdemeanors, based on a lot of the uh, original understanding of that term, really could apply to any 
abuse of official authority, uh, any abuse in the president's official capacity, and it wouldn't necessarily even have to be something that violated a criminal statute. So even if the bribery interpretation we discussed earlier doesn't fly for some reason, that doesn't mean that what is alleged in the whistleblower complaint wouldn't be considered to be an impeachable offense. How about the conduct from your perspective? And as mentioned, uh, you're a former federal prosecutor in your own right. Uh, we've talked about some of the egregious language and behavior uh, that the president has shown and I, I think been abetted uh, by not just some folks in the media here, um, but his own party with silence to the whistleblower, um, talking about things like bounties and, uh, uh, you know, basically putting to death because it's considering traitorous, even though he followed all the proper protocols. That all said, um, how about the inspector general, and, but more than that, even the DNI, how this was handled um, and that this went to the White House. And we'll talk about Bob Barr in a second, but that they went to White House counsel before they even, even notified Congress for this, not for an hour, not for a day, but for a while here. What do you make of that and how the chain of command clearly didn't seem to work? So the statute governing this situation says that once the inspector general of the intelligence community determines that a whistleblower complaint is not only credible, but a matter of urgent concern, which is a defined term of art under the statute, then it is required, the word used is shall, that the whistleblower complaint being forwarded to Congress. There is no discretion about it. So the fact that there was a delay in doing so, and they only did so after it became public, of course, is a matter of concern. Now, uh, the DNI claimed that because he wasn't sure whether this unprecedented situation really fell within the terms of the statute. He wanted to get the White House counsel's legal opinion before he forwarded it to Congress. He may have been acting in good faith in doing that. It's hard to know. But it does seem that they should have been turning it over immediately and without delay. And that just sort of adds to the aura of, of cover-up, unfortunately. We mentioned some of the folks close to the president may have concerns. Is it, is it wrong of me, Stephen, that I have legitimate worries that the attorney general of the United States, um, who should be our top law enforcement official in this country and calling, you know, um, shirts and skins here fairly, that he has given no reason, I mean, from the Mueller report on his, his, uh, his version or translation thereof to everything after the fact, that we have reason to wonder if he's going to be an honest broker in this process and the Department of Justice very possibly is going to have a role to play. It's not crazy for you to be concerned about the objectivity of the attorney general. His four-page summary of the Mueller report, his press conference after the Mueller report, his unilateral determination that there was no obstruction of justice, his comments thereafter, his involvement in uh, the delay in transferring the whistleblower complaint over to Congress, uh, which looks like there was some of that involvement. All of those things taken together, I think, can lead a reasonable person to question the objectivity of the attorney general, which is a shame because the Department of Justice for many, many decades has had this reputation of being apolitical, at least in these kinds of matters, where it was important for there to be someone who was objectively looking at the law. So I think the concern is a, is a legitimate one. Uh, I don't know what we do about it. I do know this, though, that under the constitutional framework we have right now, now it's in the House's hands. And if the House goes forward with an impeachment inquiry and then eventually passes an impeachment resolution, the attorney general won't really be able to do much about that. Interesting times that we live in. Stephen Mulray, I appreciate your time, though. Thank you so much. Thank you. Take care. Coming up next, President Trump, it turns out, never met a conspiracy theory that he didn't like. We're going to show you what we mean and also point out how worrisome that could be.